Hi, this is Ken Koeninger, and uh, this is a lecture on applying the multimedia principle. The multimedia principle learning objectives are that you learn to describe the multimedia principle and why it is effective for learning, and that you learn to recognize when the multimedia principle has been violated and when it has been applied well. Multimedia is one of six uh, uh, multimedia principles or media element principles we'll be talking about. Um, and to illustrate it, let's start off with a question. Which of the following is better for student learning? Learning from words and pictures or learning from words alone? Consider an example. You're uh, given uh, a goal of creating instruction about how learning works. And you can either describe it in text alone or you can describe it with text and with a corresponding graphic. Make a prediction about which you think is gonna be better before moving on, A or B. After your prediction, uh, you can continue watching the lecture. Be an active self-regulated learner. Okay, so um, to help you further, let me give you a couple other examples. Here's one um, about uh, a how a bicycle pump works. And the contrast is between uh, providing instruction in words alone at the top here as the rod is pulled out versus explained with words and graphics. So notice the same words are here as the rod is pulled out, air passes through the piston, air passes through the piston. So the difference is that the this is just the words versus the words and the image. So again, think about which is better for learning. Here's a third example domain. Uh, learning how brakes work. And notice these are all processes of some kind for which it's pretty clear that a, a, a graphic is going to provide some detail to it. But notice too in this, this example, and I'll show you results of an experiment with this example, they took some uh, uh, precautions here to make sure that the verbal description was as complete as possible showing uh, the uh, describing in words, the connections that are uh, visually apparent in the diagram. So you essentially have the same information in words versus the information combined in words. So here the, the words are fewer, right? It doesn't include these things that you can get from the diagram. Um, and then there is also this diagram. So uh, before uh, uh, talking about your prediction, Let's think about how you could find out which of these instructional approaches leads to better learning. What would you do? Well, running an experiment would be a great way to do it. You, you'd create an, ex, uh, an assessment that could measure a uh, student's knowledge of bike pumps. You would randomly assign students to either use the words alone condition, that instruction, or the words and graphics condition, because the hypothesis here, the multimedia hypothesis is that the graphics are gonna help. That's the treatment group. The words alone are the control group. And then after students go through that uh, um, instruction, you would give them your assessment to see who scores more, uh, uh, who scores better on the knowledge, uh, on the assessment uh, or measure of knowledge of bike pumps. So, in this study, I'll summarize the results of, they created a transfer assessment set of tasks. It was these five questions, like why do brakes get hot? What could be done to make brakes more reliable? Note, by the way, these assessments uh, require human grading. And while you can deliver them online, it would be challenging uh, to give automated feedback uh, or to do automated grading of these unless you had natural language processing. But of course, um, you can grade these and give feedback uh, um, in an e-learning situation. But this was done you know, in an experimental lab and the experimenters graded the results in both conditions. So here's how their study uh, went. This, and it, it, uh, they've done lots of these kinds of studies to be sure. Uh, but this one involved 34 uh, novice females, college students. Um, they had the text and labeled illustrations in one condition versus the text alone. They created an experience questionnaire, a, a kind of sense to get a sense for whether uh, any of the participants had a lot of prior experience on, uh, um, on how breaks work. 
Um, and they created three kinds of post tests. I showed you the transfer test, but they had a, a test of, of their recall, what was in the, in the instruction and their recognition was the following uh, verbatim text in, and, and here the idea was, could they recall exactly what was said in the instruction and notice the procedure. First students were randomly assigned to one or the other of the instructional conditions and they did that condition. Um, then they filled out the experience questionnaire and then they did the three uh, post assessments um, and notice that there was a, set, a substantial amount of time given to these post assessments. Here are the results. You can see in, over here in the graph that the results of the problem solving transfer test showed better uh, proportion correct on those five uh, questions, pretty hard questions, right? 53% correct for the group that had the illustrations. This is the multimedia group and uh, versus poor performance for the no illustration group, a uh, statistically uh, reliable effect. Interestingly, uh, for the verbatim recognition test, there was no difference between the two groups, the illustration group and the no illustration group did about the same uh, of their uh, exact precise uh, recognition of what had been in the instruction. So multimedia helps the learning of principles, generalizable concepts about, in this case, how breaks work, but multimedia is not helpful in learning facts. So this is an important thing to remember about these principles is they don't apply in all circumstances. And in this case, a key uh, um, boundary condition is the nature of the learning goal and what kind of knowledge is being uh, desired. If it's principle knowledge, then multimedia will help. If it's factual knowledge, mere memory, uh, then multimedia is not gonna help. So this is uh, one of uh, nine studies that Mayer and colleagues had done, done. They did ones on lightning and ones on how a bike pump works and in some other domains. Um, they got big uh, percentage gains between the, treat, uh, between the treatment and control and big effect sizes as well. Um, and as we go through the other multimedia principles, we'll be talking about other studies. And you can see there've been many with pretty consistent and pretty big outcomes. Uh, so back to this question, um, we've seen that words and pictures are better with the constraint that we're, the learning goal is about principles, generalizable ideas, in particular about the way things work. Uh, many of these um, uh, examples have in multimedia are particularly effective when the learning goal is about how something works. Um, so why is does it work? What makes it work better? So try to generate an explanation yourself here, be an active learning here in this passive learning setting. To help in that uh, and to help in interpreting all the multimedia principles, uh, Mayer has this cognitive process of, of instructional materials uh, that starts off with key premises that students process instructional material through their eyes and ears. If it's visual material through their eyes, they see it. Or if it's narration, audio, like you're listening to me, they process that in their ears. Um, and then it's stored in corresponding working memory, uh, sometimes abbreviated WM. There's two kinds of working memory associated with the ears is auditory working memory. Narration is processed by the ears and stored temporarily. Working memory means that memory you have for while you're working on stuff, in this case, while you're trying to learn, stored in auditory memory. Uh, the on-screen text and the visualization are presented uh, to the eyes, right? And they're stored temporarily in visual memory. And the two uh, um, things that you're remembering from what you might be hearing and seeing then need to be integrated. Um, and in the case of multimedia, you may be seeing two different kinds of content, uh, text um, and the visualizations. So this next step is integrating to develop an understanding that's building referential connections. And then there's storing in long-term memory.
note, by the way, this particular experiment really didn't test how well stored in long-term memory uh, was the learning um, because the test was immediately following the instruction at a longer delay would help better test how well it was stored in long-term memory. Um, so the simple explanation that Mayer provides is that students, uh, when they're given words and pictures, can better mentally build both a verbal and pictorial model. Um, they can visualize both and then make the connections between them. So that, that's in that referential connections uh, stage where the key to the explanation is. Um, so here are a few other examples to help you in the learning goal of can you detect when it's applied well or not? Is this a good application of the multimedia principle? Um, so we have some instruction down here to assess the functions, click on the formula tab. Oh, let's notice, by the way, um, this is a lesson um, in, a, in a course about using spreadsheets and it's about saving time with functions. And there's some verbal instruction to assess the functions. Click on the formulas tab located at the top of the toolbar and then select the drop down menu next to the function category you want. So we have a verbal description and we have a visual display, right? So we have the two elements of the multimedia principle. Um, how about this one? Um, we have words here, um, and this is about ammunition. So you got to think about the instructional goal. That's clear, right? We have a description about ammunition. We have an illustration here, but is this a good application of the multimedia principle? Is this going to help you build referential connections? about the content uh, that's describing, you know, how ammunition works when these compounds decompose, the internal energy is released. Do you see any compounds or any uh, process images of internal ed energy being released? You don't. So um, it's not just about whether there's an illustration, but it has to be relevant to the instructional goal, to the learning goal. So this is a, not a good application of multimedia, whereas the previous one uh, had the key elements of it. Um, so one thing we'll be talking about for all the principles we discuss is whether they are completely domain general or whether they have some kind of dependency. I called this a boundary condition earlier. Principles like the, the instructional principles like the multimedia principle are often communicated as though they're domain general and indeed they work in lots of domains. Uh, will they actually apply across all domain context? And no matter what the content uh, um, or the knowledge component goals are, we sometimes call knowledge components, the, the, the learning, the specific elements that of, of the learning objectives, knowledge components. Um, and uh, um, if you know about our knowledge, learning and instruction framework, it suggests that there are differences between knowledge goals to learn facts, which you memorize, induce skills, which can be applied across multiple situations, but may not be particularly explicit or rationalized or principles, which are more explicit ideas that have uh, rationales. Uh, what we saw is the multimedia principle doesn't apply to memorizing facts. It applies to generalizing uh, more general principles um, and perhaps to more general skills. Now, um, uh, as you, um, I hope you've read it in the text the chapter about this, there are many different kinds of graphics. There are transformational graphics, graphics uh, that help illustrate processes or procedures or even principles. Um, here we're seeing uh, a transformational vis visual that uh, of an Excel demonstration that might be given in a synchronous uh, learning setting um, where the instructor is walking through using Excel. Um, interpretive illustrations uh, are good for relationships among variables or to make intangible phenomena more visible, like looking inside 
here of a virus um, to get a sense for uh, what the science here uh, uh, related to the RNA and DNA, uh, what, it, what it does and what it looks like. Um, this is an interpretive graphic. So uh, again, multiple different kinds of graphics. Uh, and the summary here is that multimedia principle uh, is uh, about adding graphics to text um, and it improves learning when the graphics are relevant rather than decorative. And we'll talk about this uh, notion of decorative, uh, especially with the coherence princ principle, excuse me. There are different kinds of graphics and, and you can go to the Clark and Mayer book in table 4.1 that may be effective for different uh, knowledge goals as described in CLE. And so here's a, an indication of different gra graphic types and what they might be used for. The example here is suggestive that some rep representational graphics may be good for concrete facts. But in fact, if it's just about verbatim memory, as we saw, the multimedia is not going to help with that. But it definitely can help for processes. That's where most of the research has been done. And there are also examples of uh, uh, learning about relationships among variables, like using a number line to learn about relationships between negative and positive numbers. Um, and there's a nice paper in this line of work on that, where the, the number line would be a more interpretive graphic type. So that's it on the multimedia principle.